chosen to meet with us. Um, Father, what you've done in, um, in opening the door that people like us can come boldly to your throne, I think that's a, uh, it's just something we learn more and more, and it's like sometimes we're shocked at, uh, just shocked. Um, God, you made the world, and you wanted you want us to be with you. The scripture says that, uh, that you died for the sins of the whole world. God, I thank you for that. Father, we have things going on in this, this country, in this world, that's just, again, we're, we're shocked by a lot of things that are going on. Um, really. I mean, we, uh, we don't have any control, but we know the one we can rest in. We know the one that we can take refuge in. And so that's what we're doing right now. Father, um, this is your church. Whether we meet at 9 or whether we meet at 11 or uh, on Wednesday night, well, this is your church. And help us to continue to grow in that. Um, you care about every person here more than they've ever dreamed about, more than we have ever dreamed about. Thank you. I pray that you'll continue to reveal that to us. Um, so, Father, as we sing together and as we, as we listen to your word together, as we partake in, um, in, in partaking in communion together, may our hearts be all in. Thank you, Father. We pray this in the great name of Jesus. Amen. If y'all would stay with us this morning. Bye-bye. 
first before we get started with the other. Uh, the first thing, we had a wonderful night Friday night here with movie night. Oh, we had 33 people here and it was a great movie. It was a great time. Thanks to everyone that helped set it up and do that. Uh, the vision committee is believing we need to do another one of those pretty soon. So we'll probably do another one. Uh, second thing I need to announce is not as happy. It's kind of sad. Uh, we're not going to have our um, family, our life group tonight. Uh, we're worried about the storms. You know, we didn't have it last month because of the ice. Now we're doing it because we're afraid of tornadoes and storms and that kind of thing and warm weather. So we'll not have it tonight. We will not be there tonight, okay? Sorry. What? Try to do it next week. Okay. All right. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Uh, the thing I want to talk about now is Lent. We are in the season of Lent. And that means to be introspective of ourselves first. What are we doing? What are the sins we do? And what are we not doing that we should be doing? You know, there's the, that's, we look at ourselves first and open ourselves up to God, to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost all. Open up to them. Uh, some people do a lot of, uh, of um, where they don't eat, uh, fasting, fasting to allow that to happen, and some don't, you know, for, for whatever reason. But it is a time to let God in and to create unity with Jesus Christ and unity with other Christians. That's what this is all about, unity. We could use a lot more unity in the world today. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this season of Lent. We want to lay our sins at your doorstep and know that you will forgive us if we ask in a way that is going to, we're going to do better. We ask for unity, unity with other Christians within our church, within our community, within this world. And we pray for the unity surrounding Ukraine and to help those people. We lift up this ask for unity through the unifier, Jesus Christ, and say amen.
Jesus in his unity with even the people, with the Jews and he knew in the future with Christians, he used that Passover meal to do this that kind of unites us. And it's to unite all Christians with this Passover meal of communion. Uh, during that night, he was betrayed and he went to the cross to die for us and to get rid of our sins. During that meal, they broke bread, and he blessed it, and he says, eat this. This represents my body, which will be broken for you. And then after the meal, he, they poured the wine, and he blessed it, and he says, drink this. This represents my blood, which will wash away your sins. Pray, please. Father, it is so good to be here this morning with fellow worshipers who come to say, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for what you will do. And thank you for Jesus who gave it all for us so that we could have a pathway to you. And in his name we pray. And in his glorious name we say thank you and amen thank you, thank you brothers and sisters Thank you. 
seated, delighted to see you all this morning. Um, I remember as a young believer, I was, um, I was at Millican High School in California, and uh, I was part of a church that sort of uh, separated itself from everybody in the sense that, you know, if they didn't go to our church, then, well, they just weren't spiritual enough. Hmm, Rick's Mark. That I, that I thought in those terms, but I was taught that. So one day, uh, uh, these guys, man, the, they're guys and girls, they would have these Bible studies on campus. And I didn't join them because, you know, they weren't going to say what I thought they should be saying. So I didn't join them. And I remember there was one guy, yet yeah, his hair was longer, probably down to his shoulders. And I just, boy, I used to hammer him and say, you know, you shouldn't have your hair that long. And I told him a verse of scripture and said, you should cut your hair. And I got on all the time. You know, one day he came in, he had his hair cut, you know, like as short as mine. And uh, I just felt bad about that. I still feel bad about that today because this guy just loved Jesus, man. Uh, you know, sometimes we uh, kind of try to put rules on other people that really God didn't do. Um, there's a passage, if you'll bring that up for me, in Matthew 23, real quick, just real fast. Uh, it's in, in Matthew 23, 23, it says this. Uh, yep, there you go. Thank you. Woe to you, uh, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, <coughs> for you, let's see, repay tithe of mint and anise and come in and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Verse 24, I'm not sure if you've got that there, but I'm going I'm to go ahead and look at verse 24 as well. Um, I'll get it. <coughs> there it is. Blind guides, thank you, who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. What does that mean? Sometimes people can get so uptight about little things that mean nothing 100 years from now. I'll say it again. They get uptight about something that doesn't mean anything a hundred years from now, and then they uh, forget the things that are weightier, things that are more important. Very interesting. Um, I want you to know that the United States has more laws than any other country in the world. Isn't that crazy? In fact, we have, uh, we have more laws enacted in the United States in one year than most countries do in decades. Isn't that interesting? I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, remarkable. And I know that in some cases it may be necessary for certain things because we are constantly making new things and, you know, so forth. Uh, and, and it is a very industrious uh, country, very creative. But nonetheless, I find that extremely interesting. Um, so this morning, because I kept staring at this one passage, I think it's verse 16 in Matthew, uh, excuse me, in Mark 7, and it says, He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has an ear, uh, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. I'm like, you know, God, I don't want to miss what you have to say. I don't want to miss anything. I just don't. I mean, I do. I, I miss stuff, man. Um, and, and, it, it happens uh, probably frequently, but I don't want to. And so I wonder, what would be the message if Jesus, uh, and he's here, but if he were to come walking in here and he were to look at you and, and look at us as a church, what would he say? What would be some of the things that he would say? So I looked at, I went back and looked at um, a Revelation uh, chapters 2 and 3 because there are the, the seven churches there that he had a message for. And I said, I want you to hear me. So I'm just going to share some of this stuff. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But he said things like this. Um, to the first church, he said, uh, you persevered, you not tolerated wicked men, and you endured hardship for my name. Wow, that's really cool. I like that. The second church, he says, I know of your afflictions and poverty, but you're rich. Uh, third one um, says, uh, uh, I know where you live, and Satan has a home there. You hold on to those who are teaching 
false things. Hmm. I know your perseverance, the next church, I know your perseverance, love, faith, and service, but you tolerate that woman who leads you all into adulteries. Um, the next one, he says, wake up. Your deeds are not complete. Interesting. Uh, remember what you were taught and repent. Uh, the, the sixth one, you had little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I just love that. That's one of those things that runs through my mind. I do not want to ever deny his name. In fact, I want to be proud every time I say his name. And the last one is, uh, you're neither cold nor hot. You're lukewarm. But be earnest, he says, and repent. And that's interesting. So what do you think his message would be uh, for our church? And I, I don't, I'm not going to tell you exactly what that is. I'm not. I, I can't do that right now. But, but what I want to do is I want to share with you some things here in Matthew 7. And uh, this is, the, these religious people had, uh, had been observing, I want you to listen to me real carefully. They had been observing uh, Jesus feeding 5,000 people. And so think about this for a second. Um, God was doing things. In fact, if you read the end of chapter 6, which we are not doing this morning, the last four verses, uh, basically he was healing people and healing people and healing people and helping people and all this kind of a thing. And uh, you know what they're concerned about? They're concerned that the disciples are not washing their hands before they eat. And the, and the requirement, I want you to listen to me, the requirement was for the priests to wash their hands. Uh, the elders to wash their hands, but there was no demand for them. Isn't that interesting? And their, their concern was the tradition. They, in other words, they had missed what God was doing because they wanted their tradition held on to. Isn't that interesting? I think that, I think that we all have to evaluate ourselves. Um, so what, what I want to say to you first, this first point, if you bring that one up for me, is this is that the traditions of men tend to enslave us. The traditions of men tend to enslave us, and the commands of God set us free. I just want you to think about that. Wait a minute. You mean God has commands, and he has things that he wants us to, to do, and he wants us to obey, and yet that sets us free? Yeah, it sure does. Uh, only because the Holy Spirit is in our lives. But I just want you to, want you to catch that with me. You see, it's kind of like this. I have certain convictions about certain things. Um, I, just, I just do. I mean, there are certain things that I, I know that God has led me in doing certain things and not doing certain things. He's led me in certain areas, Okay. What would be wrong is if I were to come to you and say, you ought to be doing what I'm doing, even though I can't back it up with Scripture. See, that's where it becomes a problem. Um, I have, Scripture inspires me to do what I'm not doing or doing, but nonetheless, um, I couldn't find a Scripture that says you ought to be doing exactly. No, 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 no. Be very careful about, the, 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 be very careful about what we're requiring someone else to do. You see, it's kind of like someone said, um, carry your own cross, don't put it on other people, for goodness sakes. You know, let God speak. I, I have found, I have found, uh, and I know some of you other guys have, God does a far better job changing people than I ever began to do. And I've seen it so many times, uh, how he has spoken to people and changed their hearts. And move them in the right directions. So let me just kind of share a couple of these things with you. So let's look at the first seven verses, uh, if you would. The first seven verses of Mark 7, it says, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with, with defiled, that, that, that is with unwashed hands, they found fault. 
the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, and they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things, here it is, there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers, uh, copper vessels and couches. In other words, they've got a whole bunch more stuff that they try to make people uh, hold to. Okay. Uh, verse 5. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you? This is harsh. <laughs> Hypocrites. Whoa. And I sure, I don't want him to say that to me, do you? I don't want him to say that. Uh, pretenders. That's what a hypocrite. Somebody who is, who is acting. Lord, help us. Help us. Watch this. As it is written, I love that, because anytime it says that's written, folks, that's when you and I, I mean, all of this is God's word. Um, but when he says as it's written, that, this becomes extremely important. This people honor me with their lips, and their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So let me say this again. I'm going to go on to my next point. Watch this. I want you to understand that the traditions of men tend to enslave us, and the commands of God set us free. Now, Don, can you prove that they, they set us free? Yes, with the scripture. 1 John 5, 3, if you'll bring that up for me. 1 John 5, 3, and it goes like this. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I mean, it's a real strong word there. I mean, it's, it, 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 you know, it, it, it doesn't put any pressure on us. Man, is that good. So we have to stop and think. See, you say, Donald, how, how can that be that they're not burdensome? Well, it's real simple. It's because the Holy Spirit comes into your life, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, just like Romans 6 says, now all of a sudden, you, I, have become a slave to righteousness. I've become a slave to righteousness. So what does that mean? Or, and then he also says those that don't have the Spirit of God, they're a slave to sin. So what does that mean? It means that those who don't have the Holy Spirit, they are satisfied when they sin. And so therefore, when the command comes, it's like, I don't like that. Well, with the believer, though, what happens is, because they have the Holy Spirit, they become a slave to what is right, and they find themselves having so much peace when they choose what is right. Now, sometimes you and I, we're still living in the flesh here, right? And uh, we are... Uh, uh, you know, sometimes, man, sometimes we jump in the sin. No, I mean, uh, oh, I, I, I stumbled. No, 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 you jumped in, right? You dove in, right? So, so the, the flesh is still there, but I'm telling you what, what, what's going on within is God is changing you. And it's a process. It's a beautiful process. He often, often, often uses difficult times. First Peter chapter 1 or James chapter 1. Galatians, or excuse me, Romans 5. He uses difficult times to purge us in our lives. Okay? Let me give you one more verse just because you're familiar with this one. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Um, uh, let's see. Notice this. It says, uh, Come to me, all of you who are labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Right? Uh, I am for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. See? My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You see? It's a beautiful thing. So the traditions of man would just weigh us down, man. Guys, I went to this church. I, let, me, let me just say, I went to this church, and the requirements were just so many. I, I'm, I'm just telling you straight up. were so many that uh, I remember after about, I mean, two years, um, I was so burdened because I just couldn't live up to it. All the stuff. I couldn't. I was ready to leave. Now, listen, I want you to hear me. I didn't want to leave the faith, but I just couldn't do all that stuff. In fact, the, the thing that kept me there was that my mom wasn't a believer and I knew it was real. But I just couldn't do all the stuff. See? All right. 
Secondly, who bring that up for me? Secondly, it says, um, it is possible that a tradition can sound so good and yet offend God because we devalue his word. Let me show you. Let's begin. Let's look at verses 8 through 13. Let's look at it. Watch this. For laying aside, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men, right? The washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. Many other things. They do all kinds of stuff. They've got all these rules, regulations for people. Listen, folks, if you and I have, if we have all these expectations about somebody, uh, I've got to tell you, we're going to be really unhappy. I mean, I got all these expectations of you, and I want you to do this and, and that. Uh, I got to tell you, um, uh, you know, I'm going to be unhappy a lot, right? And I don't want to be unhappy. And uh, you just, sometimes you just got to let people, you got to let them be who they are. They are where they are. Just relax a little bit. Watch God do what he does. Just watch him. Um, all right, watch this. Let's keep going. Uh, Verse 9, he said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. In other words, their tradition sounded so good to them that they were actually uh, disobeying God's command. You remember, they were upset even after Jesus was feeding 5,000 people, even after he was healing all these people, they were upset about whether well, these guys were washing their hands. Stop, man. Just stop. Stop. Uh, let's keep going. It says, uh, verse 10, For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. That's what it says in the Old Testament. But, but you, I say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever you profit, you might have received from me is Corban, which means that is a gift. That is a gift to God. Verse 12. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which, uh, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. I mean, he keeps repeating it. Says, you guys do all kinds of stuff. You guys keep adding stuff. Well, stop right there. And so what happens is that um, these, these commands become so, uh, so important to them that they, and, 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 and it got to a place where it just sounded good. So here's what they would do. <coughs> Sorry about that. I didn't mean to cough into that. Okay, so watch this. So what they would do is they had this, this, this ritual that, that, you know, you could dedicate your money to God. And, that, and, and, and in so doing, you know, your parents have some need. And you're going, ah, you know, sorry guys, I already dedicated to the Lord. Now what's interesting is, they had a little clause in there. You know what the clause was? Well, they could use the money for themselves at any time. But they couldn't, but they, but they wouldn't use it for their parents. Isn't that crazy? He says, you guys have made up this tradition that is actually offensive to God. And uh, so that you can hang on to a tradition and you're, you're actually doing that. You're actually living out disobedience from God. Now, aren't you glad? I want, I want you to hear me. Aren't you glad that uh, that command is, in the sense of the, the punishment, is not going on today? I mean, how many of us would be alive, right? It says, uh, you know, that you're put to death if you disrespect your parents, right? I mean, are you, I mean, I don't know. I've got to tell you, some of us wouldn't be around. Uh, but, but, but here's what I want you to see, is that God is still serious about honoring your mother and father. And I really like it. You know, I've seen a lot of people who, uh, who have really had hard relationships with their parents. I mean, they really have. I mean, I could describe things. And, you know, sometimes people, you know, uh, they need to not continue on in the relationship because it's offensive, it's hurtful, but they can still honor them in ways that they can, they can figure out. I mean, God, that's my parent. Uh, I, I don't want to go back in and get hurt 
hurt, but they're my parents, yeah. and I, I, I'm thankful that, that I'm here, and you can figure out something, but you can in some way honor your parents. I'm just going to say this. I didn't plan on saying this, but it's kind of like, you know, I really believe nursing homes are necessary. I do. I mean, they're necessary. I mean, uh, and I'll say that forever, but sometimes I want Sometimes I just I go into them a lot, and uh, sometimes I wonder, you know, can you just put them in there, and then nobody goes see them anymore. You know, I don't know. I kind of there's something more to that than just uh, you know letting somebody else help you. Uh, so that was just a free comment. I'm not, you, know, you guys can you know reject that one if you want, but that's all I got there. Um, but I, but I do want to share this thought with you. See, there's there's really different kinds of legalism. The worst one, the worst one, we can see an incredible example of it in the 14th century with Martin Luther. What happened with him was that he was confronting the church with uh, the fact that they believed that you could be justified by works. And that's a dangerous one. You and I need righteousness from a foreign, from an alien, meaning Jesus. So we can't. There's nothing we can do, guys. We're, we're, we're doomed without his righteousness. I'm just telling you. How do you get that? Man, you just trust him. You trust in him. God, I don't trust in myself. I'm trusting in Jesus. I want, I want his righteousness in my life because I don't have any. And what happens is this. He gives you his righteousness, and then he leads you in that direction, just like Psalm 23 says. Uh, Psalm 23 says that... Uh, he leads us in the path of righteousness for what? For your, no, for his name's sake. But then also in Jeremiah says, watch this, he leads us in the path of righteousness for your good. So nonetheless, that was, uh, that was I just wanted to throw that out there. So, but no, it, it is possible that a tradition can sound so good, yet offend God by actually devaluing his word. Will you bring up 2 Peter 3.16? I hope I gave that to you. 2 Peter 3.16. It goes like this. I, mean, I didn't. Okay. I'm good. Uh, sorry about that. Sometimes I just start writing stuff down and uh, I forget to put it on mine. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. As also in all his epistles, Peter is talking about Paul, uh, speaking in them of these things in which are some things they're hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Some people just sort of take it and make it say what they want it to say, to keep their tradition, to keep their belief. Uh, they've already, they come to the Bible with a preconceived idea about what they want, and then they, you know, then they teach it like that. They twist it. Man, have I heard that. Man, that goes on. We've got more false teaching going on, ladies and gentlemen, than I've ever heard in my life. Ever heard. Uh, but there's other, you know, just let me just share this with you real quick. Um, there are traditions that are clearly man-made, and they bind people when God is not. Um, in fact, God intended to set us free. So stop and look at the stuff that you believe so strongly about. And look, it might be really, really good for you. But it may not be for anybody else. You know? Just telling you, just stop and relax, you know? Um, I remember one time uh, somebody came to me. I bought a Jeep Wrangler. So it was a 95 Jeep Wrangler. Watch this. No air conditioning. I was excited. Me and my boys, we were pumped, man. Uh, and uh, we, I mean, me and my son, and all of a sudden, now we drove across the country, took the top off, man, just drove across the country with it, you know. Uh, we had a blast with that Jeep, but I had somebody come to me in the church, and they said, you know, that just shows how worldly you are. The 95 Jeep, it was 1999, by the way, it was four years old, and they were telling me how worldly I was. Okay, okay look, listen to me. Uh, back when I, again, when I was young, um, I, I got to tell you, when I was young and I wanted to buy a car, um, I'm going to say it, I really, really wanted a Trans Am. But um, because of the way the, the, way the church taught, um, I bought me a Ford Maverick. I'm just telling you, 
you know? Somebody put a burden on me that they didn't, they didn't need to, right? I mean, I'm just saying, just, just relax, man. All right, last point I want to make is this. Uh, the last point that I want to make. Okay, watch this. If you'll bring number three in, I appreciate you helping. Watch this. Words and acts of worship have the potential of having no meaning to God if the heart, it's always the heart, is self-absorbed. I tell you what, I, gotta, I, gotta, I have to tell you guys something. This is growing in our faith as we become less and less self-absorbed. It's growing in our faith. I want to show you this. So I want to look at, we, we back up to verses 6 and 7 again. You've already read it, but I want to prove a point that sometimes our acts of worship and our words can mean nothing to God. It's potential. It's, it's possible. Watch this. Uh, verses 6 and 7 of, of Mark 7. Watch this. We're going to go down the last one. He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It's possible to do all the right stuff. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now watch this. Let's go down. Let's read this passage together. Verses, what is it? Verse, uh, uh, there we are. Yep, 14 to 23. This is our last section. Okay, watch this. When he had called uh, all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile, that, that, that shows he's defiled. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning this parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not per perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all few foods. Uh, that's what he was doing there, by the way. Uh, and he said, What comes out of a man, that's what shows he's defiled. And, for, for, and from within, out of the heart of men, proceed what? Thoughts and adulteries and fornications and murders, thefts and covetousness and wickedness and deceit and lewdness and an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. I thought that was interesting. All of these evil things come from within, and that shows that he is defiled. No stuff. Do you understand what he's saying? Just because uh, my hair is is short <laughs> doesn't mean that I'm holy. Just because um, they, uh, you know, were eating this bread, you know, and they didn't wash their hands first, doesn't mean that they were defiled. Um, you see, God always goes back to your heart. What does the scripture say? He is seeking for those who, who, uh, who are uh, uh, submissive to him in their heart. Um, so, um, nonetheless, what I, what I want you to understand here with me is that God has uh, every intention to cleanse your heart. Start there. Everything else will fall in place. Start there. You say, uh, I, I don't want to put a burden on you by saying you need to fix your heart. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No, I can't. That would be silly. What you do is you say, God, I want you to cleanse my heart. Uh, man, there's scriptures all over the place. Psalm 51, Psalm 139, several places where it says, God, search my heart. Ready? And see if there's any wicked way in me. And cleanse me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You search my heart. We can't, I can't tell what's in your heart. I can't. Uh, I'm okay with that. I'm really okay with that. Um, I'm glad you can't see all that's in my heart, right? And so, but but I want him to see it, don't you? And there's times that I'm like, you know, <laughs> I don't want him to see that. You follow me? But but it's it really comes back to uh, God. I want my heart clean. The stuff 
uh, me coming and, and worshiping here on Sunday morning, my words could be one thing, my heart could actually be something else. It's kind of like the guy, and I'll close, it's kind of like the guy uh, who was at the, uh, in a parking lot and uh, he bumped into a car and kind of made some damage to the car and so he wrote a note. So that's good, right? But he wrote the note and he says, sir, uh, the people that are around think that I'm giving you my name and phone number. I'm not. Good luck. Let us know. Right? And so it's kind of like us sometimes. Um, we can come to worship or we can go through your day. By the way, I still like that whole, whole idea about outside. We don't need it outside. We do need it inside someday. Someday. Outside, it should say enter to worship. And it should also say on the way out, it says enter to worship. I really think that. I think we ought to think like that whether we write it up there or not. Um, but I just want you to understand that when you come in or when you, when, on Monday morning, wherever you are, God cares about your heart, right? You know, he just cares about what's going on in your heart, you know? And he's the only one that can cleanse it. He's the only one. So relax. Just let him do it. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I so thank you for this church. And Lord, I, uh, I know what you're capable of doing in us. Well, I know a little bit of what you're capable of doing in us. I know a little bit. And uh, we want it all. We want to we be a church that, um, that doesn't walk with a cold heart. Not even a warm. We want to be a church where we're on fire. And it's not because of what we conjure up that we fake but we just submit and enjoy the Holy Spirit in our lives. I thank you. In Jesus name. Amen. amen. Would you stand with us please? We're going to sing together. God has spoken to you. Uh, boy, I do. I'd love to pray with you um, and uh, at any time, whether it's to right now or later, whatever. I'd love to talk to you if you want to talk about the Lord, so uh, in anything. So, we're going to sing together. Hey, Amen. Can you change that to Happy Loves, please? And, uh, Paul, you lead us in a closing prayer. Yeah.
praise. 